I am I'm always amused by God's sense of humor because I watch some of these kids up here and man, they are just like created for the spotlight. You know, they want to have the mic in their hand, they want to sing, all of that. And then the one having to follow that is I was the kid that would be up here like crying because people were looking at me, you know, I tell my parents, tell them to stop looking at me, that kind of thing. And now I have to come follow those guys. But it, it's an awesome thing that God is doing in those kids. So uh, as parents head out of here, before they leave, can you just help me say thank you to parents for being here? I also want to say thank you to Brenda Allen and to, to Bill and all the youth for helping out. To help me
turned out to be a, a pretty miraculous story, to tell you the truth, because even though he didn't have a helmet on, uh, he didn't hit his head, head very hard. <laughs> he, he went down, um, and, and, and this particular section of Al Canyon Road, there is barbed bar wire fence all along the side of the road. And so he was headed right into that barbed bar wire fence. But there was also an opening just, just wide enough for a motorcycle to go through. And out of all the places he could have gone down, he went down where he went right through that opening in the barbed wire fence. Uh, but if he were telling you the story, he would tell you it was the, one of those moments where like all of life slows down and you see all of your life before you, right? One of those moments where he just thought, this is it. This is how my life is going to end. This is the way that I'm going out, you know? And, and so it was a moment where he was absolutely stuck in a situation where he had no way out unless God just rescued him and delivered him. And amazingly, like I said, he, he survived that and survived it with um, relatively minor injuries. And it just so happened, this was 6.30 in the morning, it just so happened there were some guys out hunting at the same time. They saw it happen. They came over, were able to call an ambulance because Bill didn't have a cell phone with him. He was not getting up from that accident. Um, so, so God just provided a way out for him in that moment. Um, really, really spared him and saved him. Your, your being stuck may not be a life or death situation, but I'm sure you know what it feels like to be in a place where I don't know what to do. I don't know how to get out of this. I don't know how to make this work. I don't know how I am going to survive this. Like I said, it, maybe it's, it's the, the financial situation where you've been paying bills and you look up and all of a sudden your, your mortgage is due. And you don't have any money left. <laughs> you don't have a paycheck coming before you have to pay the mortgage and you're stuck. What, what do you do in that moment? You know, maybe it's a job where you think, you know, I, I've come all this way, I've gotten this education, and now I'm in this job, and I don't like it. I don't like the people around, but what do I do? I've gone through four years of college to get to this place, and now I'm stuck. What do you do in that moment? Maybe if we're really honest, you look up and you realize, I'm stuck with me <laughs> for the rest of my life. I, I have me to, to wrestle with and to deal with. And, and maybe you're like me, that at times you've looked up and you said, God, save me from me. You know, there, there are those moments for all of us. If you have ever felt stuck, in that way, I think you're going to really identify with this family we're going to look at today. Because they are a family that are an important, integral part of the Christmas story. Um, but they were stuck. They were in a situation that they could not control on their own. By the way, they're good people. They hadn't done anything wrong. They hadn't put themselves in a position where um, God was punishing them. They were just you, you may know their story. Their, their names are Zachariah and Elizabeth. And like I said, they're an important part of this Christmas story. I just want to read you a couple of verses from Luke to, to help you see the context that they are in. So at the very beginning of the book of Luke, it says this about them. It says both of them, so both Zachariah and Elizabeth, both of them were upright in the sight of God, observing all the Lord's commands and regulations blamelessly. Anybody in here able to say, hey, I observe all of God's commands blamelessly? <laughs> yeah, probably not, right? And, and honestly, I don't know if Zachariah and Elizabeth would say that about themselves. But this is the way they were known. They were good people. They were God-fearing people. Here's their problem, verse 7. But they had no children because Elizabeth was barren and they were both well along in years. In our culture today, you hear that, and you may think, so is that really that big of a deal, right? Not such a terrible thing to go through life. But, but just step into her shoes for a second, because Elizabeth is absolutely stuck. In this culture, in first century Israel, the way that a woman got her identity was through her family. Women didn't go to school. They didn't go learn a trade. They didn't do any of those things. They didn't learn how to work in the marketplace. What they did was they learned.
learn from their mom how to take care of a household and how to raise a family. And so Elizabeth is in a place where in a society that says women's main role and where they get their identity is from raising a family, having kids. She can't have kids. She's barren. And, and this passage just, it just announces this to us like in one sentence. You know, oh, she's there. And it moves on. But again, think about this. For her, it's not one sentence of her life. This is month after month after month of I'm trying, I'm trying, I'm trying, and nothing's happening. This is year after year when her friends are having kids, when their families are growing, and to the point where it says that she is well along in years by this point in time. It may be that Elizabeth and Zachariah are old enough to be grandparents at this point. So their friends not only have had kids, but their friends' kids are now having kids, and they still are in this situation where there's nothing they can do to make it better. You know, here we are 2,000 years later, and there are some options for women that struggle with infertility today. But even today, those are a little bit iffy, right? You don't know. 2,000 years ago, there's nothing they could do. So Elizabeth was literally stuck in this situation that she could not get out of. Her husband, Zachariah, on the other hand, um, he was a priest. And maybe he felt stuck, too. I don't know if he wanted to be a priest. This was his family line. This is what he did. Uh, but, but probably not a priest in the way that you and I think about priests. I don't know what you think of. Uh, but when I think of a priest in Israel, in, in Judaism, I think of a, a guy that would hang out at the temple. That, that's probably where he lived, was right in that area. And that's what he did, was he just worked at the temple all the time. But, but in Zachariah's case, he lived away from Jerusalem. Uh, and he was part of this group of priests that occasionally would get called up to serve. And so they would go to the temple. They would spend their days serving. And Zechariah, at this particular point, got called to serve, to, to light incense, essentially, in this holy place where only he could go in. Everybody else stood back, and they were in the courtyard area. Zechariah goes in by himself. Do you remember what happens next? If you've read the story recently, you remember as he is in this room by himself, as he is in this place by himself, all of a sudden, an angel appears to him. And we're told that it's the angel Gabriel. If you've ever paid attention to how angels appear to people in the Bible, um, have you ever noticed how people respond to angels? Yes, right. Like we've said in the past, they probably need a new set of underwears. In that moment, that's, you know, they're terrified, or what scripture says is they are sore afraid. You know, you remember that uh, that quote from the shepherds in the field. Uh, this is a terrifying moment. So Gabriel comes and Zacharias sees him and he's scared to death. He sees the, this angel, but Gabriel says, hey, 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 don't be afraid. I've got good news for you. You and your wife Elizabeth are going to have a son. This is what kills me in this story because it doesn't matter how many times I read it, I'm always amazed. So remember, he's just been scared to death. He's just seen this being come from heaven and make this announcement to him that you are going to have a son. And do you know what his response was? Are you sure? I don't know if I can, you know, we've never met before. I'm not sure if I can really trust you in this. I mean, just a, a quick word of advice. If an angel speaks to you, just trust it, okay? <laughs> Zachariah looks up and says, hey, we're old, and I don't know that it's possible for my wife to have children. Um, I'm not so sure if this is real. And, and Gabriel says, yeah, it's real. You're going to have a son. Um, and he also says, and because you didn't trust God, uh, he is going to give you the gift of silence. For the next nine months, you are not going to speak a word. And I know for some of you guys in here, that would be like a death sentence, right? If I can't talk for nine months, I don't know how I'm going to survive. Uh, but that's what he tells us, right? For the next nine months, you're, you're not going to speak. Sure enough, nine months goes past. 
Uh, Zachariah and Elizabeth had their child. Do you remember the name of the child? John, that's right. This is eventually going to be John the Baptist. At this point, he's just John, right? And, and, and by the name John, I, even though that's my name, I didn't remember this until this week, uh, but the name John means God is gracious. And so, so it's a pretty, pretty incredible picture of Elizabeth and Zechariah, they've waited and they've waited and they've waited and they've waited. And finally they get pregnant with a child and God says, here's his name. God is gracious to you in an incredible, incredible way. So John is born and everybody's standing around and they ask the question, what should we name him? Um, and, and eventually uh, Zechariah takes out a piece of paper and writes down his name is to be John. Even though there was no John in their family, his name was going to be John because that's what the angel told him to name him. And, and after he does that, after he says his name is to be John, Scripture indicates that his voice is opened again. He can speak again. He's no longer me. And when he can speak, it's almost like he breaks out in song over this infant son of his. It's almost like he just, you know, everything comes rushing out that he's been wanting to say. But what he says is this incredible prophecy about who Jesus is and how he will engage with the world around him. Honestly, what he shows us, to just give you a, a little uh, foreshadowing of what's coming, what he shows us here is God is the God who delivers us from being stuck. Our God is the God who rescues us from those situations that we can't get ourselves out of. And, and it's pretty amazing stuff. So like I said, I just want to walk through several of the verses from this song of Zechariah. It starts off in uh, verse 67 of Luke 1 and says this, Zechariah was filled with the Holy Spirit. And by the way, and that's, that's an important point because at this time, the Holy Spirit hadn't been given to all believers, right? Uh, it, it's only coming selectively on certain individuals, and Zechariah at this point is filled with the Holy Spirit. So it's not like God walked away from him because he didn't trust God, which that's so encouraging to me. I'm incredibly thankful for that. God still uses him. The Holy Spirit comes on him, and this is what he says. Praise be to the Lord, the God of Israel, because he has come and has redeemed his people. For, for our purposes this morning, um, I just wanted to point out the fact that he says he has come. In, in reality, Jesus hasn't been born yet. It's going to be another six months before Jesus is born. But in this case, what Zachariah is doing is he's saying he's coming. And here is how we can recognize the coming of God in the world. So the rest of this passage is going to start to unfold the question that we've been asking. How do we recognize the presence of God in our world today? How do we recognize the presence of God in our home today? And this passage, again, is about to just unpack for us what it looks like when God arrives in our world. He gives us, again, another clue here. He says he has come and he has redeemed his people are bought them back. Um, just going on, listen to what he says next. In verse 69, he says, He has raised up a horn of salvation for us in the house of his servant David. As he said through his holy prophets of long ago, salvation from our enemies and from the hands of all who hate us. So if, if you just read that at Christmas, I mean, this is part of the Christmas story, right? But if you just read that part of his song or this prophecy in Christmas. There's a real temptation to just kind of skim past some of it because it's like what is he talking about? This is kind of weird stuff. <laughs> a horn of salvation, what does that mean? And you know, a line of David and all this ancient stuff. And so, so I just want to stop for a second because this is very intentional language and I want you to see exactly what Zechariah is saying. If you look through scripture, I don't know if you've ever done a study on this, but if you look through scripture, it's interesting to look at what horns mean in the Bible. Uh, horns have a number of different things that they point us to, but they all have kind of the same connotation. Um, and, and it's really no mystery. You guys know 
what horns are, right? You know how horns are. If you've watched National Geographic Channel, you have seen animals with horns and they go after each other, they, they fight to see who's the strongest male, they, they uh, attack their enemies or protect themselves with their horns. Um, a number of different things that animals use their horns for uh, that we know. If you get into the Bible, it's interesting because the horn is represented in that same way all throughout Scripture. In fact, there's this little instrument in the Jewish culture that's called a shofar. And I have one, and I should have brought it today to, to, to show it to you. Um, but it, it's just a, a ram's horn is all it is. And they would blow into this ram's horn. And you know what typically they are doing in Scripture when they blow the shofar, the horn? They are calling people to battle, to war. So just like in the National Geographic documentaries, horns are used for battling and for, for warring against uh, competitors. In this case, the Jews blow the horn to call people to battle, to call people to war. There are other places in the Old Testament where the horn is mentioned in, in several books of prophecy. For example, um, in Ezekiel and in Daniel, in the book of Revelation. Every one of those books has horns that are mentioned. And in that case, it's talking about kings that are going to rise in certain nations. They are called horns, and often it's kings that are rising that will take their armies to battle against other nations. And so it's continuing this imagery of fighting and battle and, and that kind of thing. And then there's this, this point in Scripture where God gives them incredible detail on how to construct or build the altar that is at the temple. I've got a picture that I just want to show you. Uh, this is a mock-up of an altar, but the altar would have looked somewhat similar to this. Uh, it would have been overlaid in bronze. But on each of the four corners of the altar, God tells them, I want you to put horns on the altar. I think our tendency is just to redo that and say, huh, well, that's weird, and keep going, right? <laughs> because, I mean, it's just uh, why in the world does God tell them to put horns on the altar? It doesn't seem to make sense. Um, and then there are other things that happen. This, this verse isn't going to be on your screen. I forgot to put it in here. But I just want to read this to you. Listen to what Moses does with these horns on this altar. So in Levit Leviticus 8, it says this. Moses slaughtered the bull. So there's going to be a sin offering. A bull has been brought. The bull is slaughtered to be placed on an altar like this. Right. So he slaughtered the bull. And took some of the blood, and with his finger, he put it on all the horns of the altar to purify the altar. So, so after he slaughters the animal, he dips his fingers in the blood, and he just starts rubbing it on all of the horns on the altar. And you, you get that, and you just think, so weird. That is so far removed from 21st century America. I don't even know how to process that, right? Uh, but, but you know what I think is happening here? The altar is representative of God. Imagine this. If you saw an animal in the wild with horns and with blood on its horns, what are you going to think happened? Chances are that animal just got in a battle, right? And it probably won. <laughs> if it's still running around, and if it's got blood on its horn, it gored the other animal. It probably killed its competitor or its enemy or whatever you want to call it, right? Uh, do, you, do you see what's happening with this altar in Scripture? I think what God is saying is when he says put blood on the horns of the altar to purify the altar, he's saying it's just like I have gone to battle for you because the sin offering has just been made, right? It's just like I've gone to battle for you and as I've gone to battle, I have defeated, I have conquered your enemy. And so that's the picture all the way up to this point of Scripture and then Zechariah comes along and he says that God, when he comes, when he arrives, he provides for us a horn of salvation. He provides for us a protection. He fights for us against sin and against our enemies. And, and so that's what Zechariah is saying. He's saying when God shows up in our world, when God arrives, he is fighting for us against the, the enemy and against sin. He goes on 
And in the next couple of verses, he kind of says, and, and here's why God does this. So he says this, he says, to show mercy to our fathers and to remember his holy covenant, the only sworn to our father Abraham. So again, it's really easy just to, uh, I don't understand, right? But what he's saying, he's not talking about your dad or my dad. He's not talking about our literal earthly fathers. He's talking about our forefathers. And he's saying, God made a promise to Abraham and to Isaac and to Jacob that he was going to bless the nations through them. But he also made a promise to them that he would be their protector and deliverer and rescuer. There's one point where God comes to Abraham in Genesis 15 and he says, Abraham, I am your shield, your very great reward. So he says, I am the one who protects you. I am the one who delivers you from the enemy. And so Zechariah is just saying, here's why God does this. Because he is carrying out his word that he's promised to our forefathers. He is going to be our rescuer. He is going to be our deliverer. And he's doing that by coming in this child, Jesus. He goes on and says in verse 74, to rescue us from the hand of our enemies and to enable us to serve him without fear and holiness and righteousness before him all our days. And so this theme is just pounded over and over and over throughout this song where he's saying when God arrives, he is your deliverer, he is your rescuer. Let me, let me ask you a question a personal question because this is different for all of us what do you need to be rescued from what is it in your world that's making you feel stuck that's making you feel like you can't get out what is it in your world that you need to be delivered from maybe it's a habit you know what your habit is that habit that comes back all the time that you wrestle with all the time. That, that habit that at the beginning of every year you kind of say, this year, this is my New Year's resolution, I'm going to be different. I'm not going to get back into that. This year I'm going a different direction. And, and somewhere around January 20th, <laughs> it comes back up and you fall back in. What is it that you need to be rescued? Maybe it's an addiction. Maybe it's a temper that doesn't really flare until you're driving in your car on I-25, you know, or you get in traffic in Fort Collins and all of a sudden, you know, your head's about to explode. Maybe it's a temper that the only time it really, really rears its head is, is when you're with your kids and they do a certain thing and it just gets on your last nerve. Maybe it's the, the language you use around certain people when you're hanging out with those people or the way that you act when you're around certain people. Um, and, and then you go back and you feel this sense of disappointment and, man, I should have gone there. <laughs> what is it for you? What is it that you need to be rescued from? Here, here's the incredibly good news of Christmas and the incredibly good news of the arrival of God in our world. When God arrives, he rescues those who are looking for a way out. When God arrives, he rescues those who are looking for a way out. That, that doesn't mean that he rescues every single person, does it? doesn't mean that he, he's going to come and shut down your will and say, okay, I'm taking over, I'm going to do it my way. I kind of wish he would sometimes. <laughs> you know, it would be a little easier. It would be a little nicer. Um, but that's not what he does. But he guarantees you that he will rescue you if you're looking for a way out. That's what the God of our world does. It, from the beginning of time, that's what he has done. And that's part of the way you can recognize him in your home. That's part of the way you can recognize him in your life is he rescues those who are looking for a way out. There's another verse in scripture that you're probably familiar with. Um, you may not know the exact reference. You've probably heard it misquoted as often as you've heard it quoted. But in the book of 1 Corinthians, there's this verse that just says this. It says, no temptation has seized you except what is common to man. 
Uh, let me just hit pause for a second because whether or not it feels like it, it's talking about temptation, so it feels hard. But whether or not it feels like it, that's good news. You know what it's saying? It's saying you're not weird. <laughs> you're not unique. As much as you want to think, hey, this is unique to me, and I'm the only one that struggles in this way. And it, you know what Scripture says is you deal with the same temptations that people have dealt with from the creation of man on. Right? Yours may have a little twist, but from the generation before you, but you're dealing with the same thing that everybody has dealt with, right? And then he goes on and says this, and God is faithful. He will not let you be tempted beyond what you can bear. Another quick note here. Um, does it say God will not let you be tempted? And just stop. No, again, I wish he would say, okay, I'm going to save you from all temptation, right? Um, even Jesus was tempted. Jesus was tempted just as we are, right? Hebrews tells us that. He went through the, the temptations that it's talked about in Matthew and other places. Um, just because you're with God doesn't mean you're not going to be tempted. Temptation still comes. But here's, the, here's the, the final thought of this verse. But when you are tempted, he will also provide a way out so that you can stand up under it. The God who has delivered people from the beginning of history to now says, I, when I come into your world, I will rescue you, I will deliver you if you want the way out. The promise of 1 Corinthians is God will provide you a way out. The question for us becomes, do you really want it? <laughs> That's the hard one, right? That moment where I have to decide, okay, am I going to go my way or am I going to go God's way? And I think we, we've all been there, right? But when God arrives in our world, he rescues those who are looking for a way out. Some of you are familiar with a movie um, that's several years old now, a movie that Tom Cruise was in. Uh, I have never seen the whole movie, so I am not recommending this movie. I'm not saying go out and watch it. But you probably have heard of the movie before. Um, the movie is called Jerry Maguire. Anybody remember what the famous line in Jerry Maguire is? Show, show, show me, me the money. money. That's right. Yeah, show me the money. And if you remember the movie, I've seen clips of it. If you remember the movie, Jerry Maguire is uh, on the phone with his... He's, a, he's like an agent. He's on the phone with his athlete that he's working with, and they're, they're talking about money, and it comes up, show me the money, this bill, right? Show me the money, show me the money. And they're screaming it in the phone. And, um, it, it's almost like what they're looking to to deliver them from one situation to the other is the money, because that's what's going to take this athlete from where he is in life to where he wants to be in life. And, and I think all of us have some of this idea in our minds that, yeah, money can be a deliverer for him. I just had a little more. If I just made a little more, then I would be in a good place, right? Um, but what God shows us is that it's, it's not wealth. It's not money. He is our deliverer. And the reason I mention that movie to you is because I want to I want to put a twist on it for you this week. All right, um, this week I can guarantee you, probably before this day is out, I can guarantee you, you are going to face some sort of temptation. Maybe it is that habit that keeps coming back. Maybe it's that same thing that you've wrestled with for a long time. Right? At some point, you're going to face, and when you face that temptation. Here's what I would encourage you to pray. Not God, show me the money, but God, show me the out. Open my eyes. Help me to see. You promised me you're giving me an out. Show me the out. And maybe even, like we have on the screen, maybe even take that with what Jesus says in the Lord's Prayer and say, God, don't lead me into temptation, but when it comes, when I'm there, God, Show me the out because you are my rescuer. You are my deliverer. I am stuck without you. I have no way around this apart from you. But you are my form of salvation. So God will you give me the way out. You might even want to think about it in terms of the horn of salvation, like we just talked about. Like, like God, will you turn your horns toward the enemy? Will you gore and take on sin 
and I'm going to run the other way to take the door out. But, but again, the question is, do you really want to take the way out? That's who God rescues. That's who God delivers. This week, it's going to happen. I guarantee you. It is going to come up, whatever it is. But here's your prayer. God, show me the out. Whether it's my friend who calls up randomly and invites me to lunch to get me out of the house. Whether it is, you know, an opportunity to, to sit down and just open your word and see what you have to say to me in this moment. God, show me that. And as you do that, God will rise in your world in a way that will absolutely amaze you. So let's go to him and ask him to help us. Father, we are amazed by you. We're so thankful that you're a God who cares for us. A God who is our protector and our defender and our rescuer. We pray that this week, Father, you would give us clarity of thought in those moments of struggle, in those moments of temptation to say, God, show me now and then take it. Father, we want you. There is nothing greater in this world than you and your presence in our time with you. And so we want more of you. Please help us to walk with you and to experience your presence with us, your arrival with us throughout this entire Christmas season. We love you so much, Jesus, and we pray these things in the power of your name. Amen. Amen.